evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Jackson County Board of Education work session for August the 5th. We have a little different agenda to start off with this evening. Tonight is our first uh, public hearing um, concerning our, our budget. Uh, we are required to have two, and this is our first, so we would like to convene this uh, public hearing for comment on our, on our budget in Mildred. Um, that's the purpose of this public hearing, so we would, we would ask that you would uh, keep your comments directed to our budget and to our village rate. Um, so being 6 o'clock, we'd like to convene this public hearing, so if there's any citizens here wishing uh, to speak and, and weigh in on public comment concerning our, our budget and village rate, um, now would be the time uh, to do it. So if you would, you could come forward the microphone if there's anyone here wishing to address the board. Mr. Clancy, I would add that the budget um, is linked in assembly and we are projecting it and we are recommending the full rollback rate of 16.576. So that would um, yield the tax increase to existing property owners. Could you repeat that? We can't hear you. Back. Yes, sir. The budget is posted, and the Board of Education has evaluated the budget proposal that we're presenting. And based on our fund balance, we are, we are suggesting and recommending a full rollback rate. So we will go back recommended rate of 16.576, which does not uh, yield a tax increase for existing property owners. Assessments, assessment strike, that would be nice. It's a reduction from the current millage rate of 18.39 million. So a significant, significant reduction in the millage rate. Uh, we, we've adopted a, a tentative budget, uh, but we're required to have two public hearings uh, before we formally adopt our budget. So this would be the time for us to uh, receive any comment on that. But, um, as Dr. Howard said, uh, Reggie, Say it higher, or you like to well, say Based on what you just said, I'd like to make a comment. Please, come to the, just state your name and address for the record, please, when you get to the microphone. For the record, my name is Dick Crosby. I live in Meadow Creek Farms. And you heard me before, and I didn't expect to speak tonight, but I'm excited and pleased to see that you're rolling back the rate. However, what does that really mean? Do you know as of tonight what the tax digest is? So you have that number? And what is that number? I'm going to let our CFO, Anna, can you respond? string, you know? <laughs> okay, so it's going to be posted next week. That's correct, the five-year history. Mm -hmm. The five-year history, right. including this current year. Yes, sir. Because that's where your money's come from, correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, we can wait a week, but here's a question that a number of citizens have asked me. How does Jackson County compare to Jefferson and Commerce as to dollars per student. How do you calculate that? Different, 
Digest is a compilation of all of the county tax dollars. Am I correct? Only the MEO for Jackson County Board. Right. Jefferson has their own administrator. I'm not talking millage rate. Yes, yes, I'm talking yes, about. Yes. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Could you repeat it? No, I was saying it. Both the city of the Jefferson School System and the city of the Commerce School System levy their own military rates. Against the budget, or the tax digest. So my question is, do you have equal dollars coming out of the tax digest to each of the three entities, the school system? is levied on the unincorporated Jackson County where the students that we serve. Jefferson and Commerce have a different tax base. They have their own. Okay, so it's impossible to say a student in Jackson County costs 10000 a year, a student in Jefferson costs 9000 a year, and a student in Commerce based on that. So I was trying to clear up my theory because people are confused. They've been waiting for this gigantic landfall that the Tax Digest is bringing to the county. And we, countyans, don't want the cityans to reach in and get a bigger handful than we do. Just a concern on our part. So. Who set, they set their own millage rate, correct? You set the county's millage rate. The, the, the county and the county schools. And the city, county, county schools. The, the cities that don't have their own school system, which is the other the nine, nine cities in Jackson County, but two have a school system. They established, they have their own digest, they established their own millage rate for their schools. We established the rate for Jackson County schools everything but Jefferson Commerce. Okay. Let me ask you. But it truly comes from the county. I mean, the county rolls up a big number, right? Well, it does. The, so if you live in Jefferson, you live in Jackson County. Correct. If you live in Jefferson, the Jefferson Tax Digest uh, does not, none of their money, none of the money for Jefferson comes to the county, and none of the money in the county goes to Jefferson. <coughs> when it comes to schools, when it comes to schools. So is it fair to say that the city of Jefferson is paying for their schools? Yes, yes sir. From their tax digest? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Why is it then in the uh, posted summary of the Georgia state law, it says tax millage rates are considered and set by for the county, the board of commissioners, for the city, the city authorities, and the county school, the board of education. So are the city schools, city schools rolled into the city authorities? They are independent school districts. They have their own. Yeah, all taxing, all taxing districts, if they want to be village, has to provide that military, their own 
They have the final word, but you recommend, as does the city, those cities. Am I correct? That's the only three schools in the county that have access to tax dollars? Okay. Because some tried to tell me there were four, and I said, where's the fourth? And they said, well, Brazelton. I said, there's no Brazelton school. So, at least I was right on something, anyhow. All right. So the, the posted budget projected millage rate budget that uh, they were kind enough to hand to me is just shy of $100 million. That's a big number. That is a big number. Then I see we I... Have, we have all right. 9,500 for the year is the forecast, correct? Yes. Okay, 9,500. All right. We grew, we grew from last year to the end of May. We began to get the school year. We were about over 600 students just over summer. That's the school. Okay. Yeah. 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 And it looks like you're on the front end of a tidal wave based on the building boom that I see on the western side of the county. A difficult task at best, I'm sure. But, as long as you ask, what have you decided about us seniors and helping us out in a fashion to save the seniors over 65 some tax dollars? So, Mr. Crosby, this budget cycle, we have rolled the bills back in, in an effort to help all taxpayers in, in Jackson County. Right. So the, the discussion uh, that you raised earlier in the year that relates to 65 and over, there are some exemptions already available Understood. Uh, to uh, folks that are 65 and over, and, and we support those as far as new exemptions. That's a discussion that's going to take a little longer to, uh, to complete and understand the ramifications. So we have not made a final decision one way or the other. The decision that we've made is to roll the millage back to help all uh, taxpayers uh, for this next year. And all of us taxpayers appreciate that. But remember, we're still working against that big assessment number that was passed on to us in May. That assessment number was documented to each individual landowner. Yes, we had a right to appeal. Some of us received some favor. In effect, there were reasons why, because when numbers are inaccurate, the appeal process corrects those, and we recognize that. And yet at the same time, you look at our sister counties around Jackson County, there is nobody that hits the senior population harder than Jackson County with the tax dollars. And that's what you have to be addressing for the future. I, just, I understand. You can't do that tonight. And it'll take a, a process to get that done. But keep in mind, when I'm driving down the highway and I see 200 homes going up on the left, 300 homes going up on the right, homes here, homes there. You can't tell me there's not revenues coming in to offset the Board of Commissioners' excuse that we don't have the, commission, the commercial or industrial base to give the seniors a break. And we just don't happen to buy that. Mr. Crosby, I appreciate your, your comments. The entire board does. And um, what I would what I would suggest uh, going forward for you and, and your group, um, I, I would I would dig a little deeper on the digest 
Now I would dig a little deeper on the assessed values uh, on properties in the unincorporated portion of Jackson County. And I would evaluate the residential values and the agricultural values and the industrial values. All this is, is public record. Um, I, I only say this because I've, I've done this myself. I would, I would suggest that um, that's how you really can dig a little deeper and then you can direct your comments accordingly after you've um, seen something. You may have already done that. And I would, I would address those comments to the boards that uh, establish the values. And with, with apology, like I said, I didn't expect to get up here tonight, but Mr. Griffey, who requested to come and speak, he would have gone into more of that detail. Because yes, we are looking at that. We recognize there's some incongruities in that. And as a result, that has to be addressed even before it can go to legislation for a vote. I think we're all in agreement on that. We are. And I, again, uh, Mr. Griffey is spearheading our group. He apologizes for not being able to be here tonight. But I guess I just couldn't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anyone looking to follow Mr. Crosby? I have a text. If you don't mind, if you would just state your name and address for the record, please. Sure. My name is Ross Harvin. I live at 50 Dibble Drive. West of the Road, the Hill Not the Hill Park Road. Uh, my question is with the $13 million from plan. I know it's spread out through Alpha County, so how much of that money is going to be budgeted for the county, Jackson County School System? Because it says it's spread between three school systems in the American Rescue Plan, 13.6 million. How much is going to Jackson County School System? That's all. dedicated to Jackson County, Jefferson City, and Commerce City have their, their independent school districts okay. in terms of allotment through the funding of the state and the federal level. Okay. So is that under the CARES, the CARES Act round two? Or where is that money? What, what's the intent of that money? We have, we, I don't want to step on you. Andy, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, so we're looking at the we're looking at that money to trying to um, fill our gaps. We can get back to the tutoring all throughout the spring, and then you'll also get very specific financial programs in all schools. Okay. And that will continue through this upcoming year and summer as well. So as you say, that's over time. Right. And then seven mindsets. How much is budgeted for seven mindsets? the program, PBIS, and Seven Mindsets, Equity, Social Justice, how much is budgeted for that? Seven Mindsets is an initiative that we started last year. What is that, less than $100,000 a year for the entire program? Uh, for all the books and all. Yeah. Okay. It is not 30. Yeah. Okay. Thirty thousand dollars for social justice so and equity. Okay, go on their website. It's on there. Don't worry about it. There is a lesson on social justice. Correct. Preparation compacted underneath an enveloping thing. That's just a question. You answered my question. I don't need any more explanation about it. The next question is with the millage rate, thank you for reducing it. Will you reduce it more if you intend to shut down physical schools because of COVID 19? Will you reduce the amount of money I pay in taxes? Will you shut down the physical spaces that my children go to school that I'm paying for those buildings for COVID-19? Don't intend to shut schools down. Right. I know. I'm asking a what if question. Our, our plan, uh, your last name is it Harvey or Harvin? Harvin, H-A-R-V-I-N. Our, our plan, Mr. Harvin, is to 
to educate the children that come to us, our plan is not to close these schools going forward. Okay. In the event that we in the event that we do, similar to what happened last year when we went to remote learning, I'm guessing that's kind of where you go. Yeah, I, I mean I understand how it works. What I'm tracking on here is the C D C and all these other organizations. I know this is about budget, but budgetary constraints have to deal with remote learning. The physical spaces are being open, right? The brand new high school that we built that isn't even big enough for the students. Okay. So what I'm asking, what I'm saying is, and I know nobody wants to shut down the schools. I understand you don't. And you're gonna follow the guidance that comes from a we'll just say guidance that comes from an organization. But I paid it, I'll gladly pay it. Matter of fact, for that I have four children in the school system. I'll gladly pay pay more for senior citizens not to pay it. I don't have a problem with that. I know not everybody in the county does, so that's a whole other story you have to sell to them. But I want my kids to be in school because it's a social learning situation. I want my kids And I'm gonna pay for them to be in school. You know, I worked last year. I had to, I was at risk of losing money, but educators were not. And I'm not demeaning ed educators or anything like that. I'm just saying, a government job, you're not at the risk of losing money, whereas a lot of people are. I want my children to go to school. I don't want my children to have to do anything extra. I'm not going to touch the topic if we're talking about budget. I don't want my kids to have to do anything extra. I want them to go to school. And the biggest, probably, budgetary thing you have is going to be, well, let's see, how much is it for your buildings, right? I mean, it's a big cost, is it not? It's the, not. the largest expenditure is going to be personal services, which is going to be teachers, staff, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, it's a pretty big deal for them to be in school now because I need them, don't I? They're the biggest budgetary cost. I need them in the school to teach my children. Right. So, so, so to answer your question, Mr. Harvey, every, every year we do a, a budget analysis. Uh, our staff brings to us projected uh, costs, uh, expenditures, revenues, and we'll establish a budget every year. Right. I, I can assure you in the time that I've been on this board, that we've taken that very seriously. And, and we, this would be the uh, no, third I, time we've reduced the millage uh, since I've been on the board. So I'm, I'm yes. happy, happy for that. I want you to know that we're committed to continually controlling costs and rolling the millage back to keep it all possible. I'm not, yeah, I'm not, not actually worried about the cost as long as the schools are open. Yep, yep. I, I don't care about the cost, personally, because I just want my kids to be able to experience the school. So, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. It's not an attack on anyone. These are questions that people are really thinking about. And since it had to fit into a budgetary comment, I found a way. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else wishing to follow these two gentlemen in large public comment on the budget? Who are those men? I just hear none. We will close uh, this first public hearing. Uh, I'd like to call to order uh, the August 5th uh, work session of the Jackson County Board of Education uh, to order. Uh, all members are here. Uh, we have staff uh, in on uh, Google Meets. We appreciate our visitors, we sincerely do, we are glad you're here. Um, you are welcome to stay for the, for the entire meeting. Um, so without uh, further ado, we will move into our first item, and it's gonna be the superintendent's comments. Dr. Howard. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Clarice, and thank you all for being here. Um, Wanna start with our citizen budget. You've seen that already, and you know that this is the first of our hearings. We will have another budget hearing on September the 9th, and that will be held at Empower, uh, which is where our meeting will be. It will be a ribbon cutting event as well, so that will be on September the 9th at the Empower College and Career Center. And then, of course, uh, we are set to approve our budget and millage rate at the following board meeting on Monday, September the 13th. So we welcome uh, that will not be a hearing because we're not increasing taxes, so the next hearing is only the September 9th. Also just want to remind you that our Board of Education will be participating in a facilities planning meeting on Friday, August the 27th. We'll have that here, Board. Uh, and we have 
a really stacked agenda for you. We're going to go over enrollment and projections in uh, existing facilities and, and planning for the future. So we look forward to that day as well. You have a policy revision, which is uh, in alignment to re recent legislation, uh, public participation. You have seen that on the table, and that's um, for your review. That's just a policy revision. Um, it, it provides greater access and doesn't require people to call ahead. So that's like the base, the major change. That's correct. Because it's revision. That's correct. Doesn't have to on the table. And then you've got there uh, the next item is our logo uh, decision. And so we we would like to um, let Dr. Briscoe share a little bit about what we've done to research our our communities for really our internal community, but our staff members on our logo. You want to share with them a little bit, Dr. Briscoe? For no more here. So for the logo, we sent out a survey, um, and what came back was really shocking that there was division. We had no clear winner. Um, there were two that were pretty close, but it still was not an overwhelming majority. We did ask about colors. There was a majority there, black and silver. Um, so our options really right now are do we want to decide between the two front runners or do we want to stick with what we have been using? Go ahead and get the website launched and we yes. don't want this to label us. And so we have half the folks who wanted the compass and half who really wanted to stick with the outline of Georgia much like we have now. And based on what we're trying to do, it's probably potentially safer to just stay with what we are. Right. If we stay with what we have right now, we can launch the website sooner. And in terms of also clearly letter head, re re rebranding is, is something that we can revisit coming up. But there's a, there's a lot going on. This may not be something you want to spend a good bit of time on. No. Mm -hmm. Is it exactly like what we have? It's not exactly like it, but it's pretty close. It's just a little bit more modest. Yeah. So we'll, let's bring it back to the September meeting and be ready to go with the, the website. But I think we're probably, in, we have the, the goodbye. So we don't want to move forward with one that we brought to you without having great consensus on it. Um, did want to let you know that we were um, very happy to, as, as Mr. Harmon said, open our schools. Um, I'm very happy to have two children who attend Jackson County Schools, and there's nobody that wants kids in school more than I do. They are seniors, um, and they're preparing for college, and so I completely understand and support your concern. Um, and so what we did want to make you aware of is that we did proudly launch the school year and have had a great start. Um, we were actually hoping that COVID was in our rearview mirror, and uh, the reality is the first day of school, COVID is not in our rearview mirror. And we are still in a position that we are managing cases. Um, and so I just wanted you to be aware of where we are. This is purely information for our board so that you stay informed and for our community. Um, so if you, if you see here what we are what we're faced with as a public service entity as a school, um, we, are, we are mandated by the BPH to report positive cases um, as well as any close contact close contact and so for 2020 to 2021 we had a total of 761 positive staff and student cases um, and 6,500 from their mandatory precautionary quarantines. Uh, during our peak outbreak um, we averaged 38 positive cases a week. So and those are some uh, on the on the sidebar there you can see January to February is really our, our difficult time. And this year, thus far, it's the first week of school, we had 40, uh, 54 positive cases. Um, and so that, I think that's actually 50, 59 positive cases, um, 59 positive cases. And we updated that today, as a matter of fact. So 48 students and 11 teachers. Um, and so we're, we're in a position that our schools are uh, spending a good bit of time managing this again. Uh, at this point, we our goal, our ultimate goal is to keep students in school. And we know that students in grades seven through 12 have, have, have had access to a vaccine if the family has chosen for them to be vaccinated. And based on the guidance that we um, have had from BPH, we 
do not have to even consider quarantine if someone's wearing a mask or if they can't if they are vaccinated. Based off what? Based off what? Science? I mean, where's where's the evidence? So what what we have to do as a public entity that is supported by public tax dollars is to that's us. right? That's not us. Not is, is to consider to consider the recommendations of the CDC. What I will tell you is if it, we were strictly following the CDC guidance, if we were strictly following the CDC guidance, in fact, um, Jefferson's not. Yeah, none of us would be here. Yeah, really. 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 Yeah, that if we were strictly implementing CDC guidelines, we would be mandating masks and we would be doing 10 to 14 day quarantines, and we are not, and we're not suggesting we do that now. What I want... What I'd like for our board to be aware of is that our schools are spending a good bit of time managing positive cases and the reality is when a parent contacts us and says my child is positive then we have to respond uh, that that that's our responsibility just like just like we would if a child called and said they had chicken pox or another contagious what we've been told is a contagious disease so i understand your frustration uh, and and we're not here to change our guidance i i just want our board to be informed that this is what we are managing in the schools, and it does impact what our principals and our school leaders are spending their time on. And so we have to be thoughtful about if this trend continues, we have to have a way to manage what's happening. Our, our, our preference would be that COVID didn't exist. Our preference would be that our kids would be in school and this wasn't an issue. But we do have to manage what we are presented with. So if I if I could ask this, at what point? if you're going to, I'm simply going to ask that you come to the microphone because there's a lot of people yelling. I we can't hear you. Come to the microphone. If you wouldn't mind, just state your name and address for the record, please. Um, my parents graduated from Jefferson in the 70s. I, I, as you can tell, I'm a healthcare worker. Have been for 15 years. And I worked through COVID. I had four weeks that I didn't, didn't do my job. I worked in a doubled up N95 mask for all the way up until I got vaccinated in January. The reason I got vaccinated was because I went to talk to my doctor and given the job that I do, it was recommended that that's what I did. He, my, I even talked to my pediatrician, the same doctor that, that gave me my advice is the doctor that I went to to get the advice for my children. I saw him Friday afternoon. I asked him because I've listened to every board meeting that you guys have done and y'all do a great job and I do appreciate everything you do for our school system. I truly do. Starting last summer, I had listened to every board meeting. 
that y'all have put on, and I've agreed with the majority of what you have said to a certain degree. And I knew on the meeting that you had on the 23rd of July, when you called a quick session on 7.30 in the morning, you typically don't do that. I had a feeling that this was going to be something that y'all were going to bring up, was about masks and mandates and stuff like that. And you did touch on it a little bit. So I asked my kid's pediatrician this past Friday what he would recommend for my first grader and my third grader. If y'all got to the point where you did, they did pass a saying that five to 12 year olds could get vaccinated or the, the fact that you needed the mandatory mask. My pediatrician who I love and respect dearly told me absolutely not. He said, there is no reason that a child should be walking around for eight hours a day in a mask. I asked him why, because I don't, want that, I don't want that explanation of just no. I want to know why. Give me facts. Give me a reason why you say that. He told me things that brought me to tears. He said, if people could see the number of prescriptions that I have written for children for ADHD medication to keep yes. them focused on a computer long yes. enough to get them through digital learning, if they could see the number of referrals that I have sent for pediatricians, pediatric therapists, psychiatrists, for children that are, that are struggling with anxiety and depression because they've been socially isolated or forced to be put in a mask for eight hours and try to focus when they're in school, if they could see these things that these pediatricians are seeing, they wouldn't want a kid to be in a mask because of a possibility of COVID that would do nothing to them at this point because there's no evidence. I'm begging you, my son, I told my kids, I can't be home with you for digital. My husband's a fireman and works eight, eight to five because he's in the fire marshal department. He cannot be home. We cannot be home with our kids to do digital. It falls on my mother, a grandmother, who knows nothing about a computer. And I struggled. I had my own anxiety. You want to know? I had to go on medicine to get my kids through the last year of school. I can't do that again. I don't want my kids in a mask. And I know, I know the evidence. I know the data. I went to school for this type of stuff. And I can tell you without strapping an N95 mask on a child, you're not going to keep COVID out. Yeah. 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 You're only going to put a cloth on your face to keep snot off. And then it's going to smear on your face. And that's, that's the honest to God truth. And I'm not here to, to yell. I'm here to make y'all have a clear understanding of what this group of people is standing here for. Is for y'all to have some real, I know you have to go by your data and your numbers, but there's other things you need to really consider before you make those, this, those tough decisions that some of these other superintendents are making. And I truly do appreciate all that you people do. That's it. So before we, I, I, I just want to clarify, we do not plan to, to mandate masks. And so I, I want you to understand that. Okay, can you come to the microphone? Do you mind? You said your name and address for the record. Sure. And who's both? Hey, both. So you are my representative for District 3. That's why I'm asking. I've never met you personally. Just, yeah. I'm Patricia Kidwell. District 3, West Jackson area, 113 William Ridge. Um, I'm just going to read a little letter, kind of piggybacking, piggybacking on what um, she just said. I'm sorry, I forgot her name. I'm a, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I work at Northeast George. I've been there for 17 years. Been dealing with this last year, COVID, not necessarily frontline because I'm in the outpatient setting. Everything about these masks is a lie, okay? We've got some evidence to show you that. So I don't really care what the CDC says. There are opinion pieces. They've yet to show any evidence that a paper mask works. Okay? If you can smell through it, you're breathing something in. And I'll, and I'll tell you why in just a second. This is a letter from a pediatrician in North Carolina. She's practiced medicine for over 30 years. She's board certified and has worked in various settings. 
Children have limited symptoms and severity of illness from COVID-19. This is a much lower rate of severe illness and in hospitalization than what we generally experience with influenza. Many medical studies have asserted the same conclusions. When mask mandates were initiated in the summer of 2020, we observed no changes in transmission of COVID-19. We encountered no increase in severity of illness in the community, nor among our children and their families. When mask mandates were lifted this spring, we did not encounter a spike in the number of cases of COVID-19. It is our conclusion that masking has not been helpful whatsoever to, in limiting the transmission of the pandemic. Again, you may avail yourselves of numerous studies performed in different locations that have, have asserted the same outcomes. Many effects have occurred due to masking and social distancing that have ne negative to, negatively impacted our children. Our patients have become more depressed, anxious, and withdrawn. Their mental health has suffered, resulting in spikes in psychiatric hospitalizations, suicide attempts, and death due to suicides, which is already high in our teenagers anyway. This is a well-known and cited outcome to COVID management, including mask wearing and social distancing in children, including quarantining. Our patients have developed, developed an increased frequency in facial rashes and skin infections since wearing masks. They are exposed to higher CO2 levels, resulting in higher heart rates and intolerance to heat and exercise when required to wear masks for hours at a time. There are many accounts of physicians reporting similar outcomes in their patients as well. In short, it is not in the best interest of our students to be mandated to wear masks for extended amounts of time as they can cause harm to health and mental well-being of our children or to quarantine. It is our conclusion that masks should not be imposed, but rather an option. Yeah. That quarantine should not be imposed, but rather an option. Yeah. So that parents may decide what is best for their children. It is our hope and prayer. It is our hope and prayer that our students have a successful and wonderful school year and they are not limited by anything that would encumber them. And the reason why I read that letter is I have a couple points that you guys may not have be aware of. Masks have a much larger pore size than a virus. Vaccinated persons are still getting COVID and as a matter of fact, at Northeast Georgia, those said vaccinated patients, we're really having a hard time treating them. They're not, they're not bouncing back because they've been vaccinated, by the way. Something that mainstream media is not telling you. Nope. Very sad. Yep. Four million children in the U.S. have tested positive for COVID. Four million. 337 have died. One is too many. So that's less than 1%, okay? So they have a survival rate of 99.97%. Yep. So why are we quarantining healthy children utilizing contact tracing. Forsyth County doesn't yeah. contact trace. Yeah. Bates County does not contact trace. As a matter of fact, in Jefferson, if a child has been in close contact, they email the parent and they say, if your child doesn't develop symptoms overnight, they may return to school the next day. Yeah. But, you're not mandating vaccines, but what you're saying, I'm sorry, not what you're saying, what your guidelines, the three-letter agency that's been so reliable through all of this, but if a child is masked and they've received a vaccine, they don't have to be quarantined. So in essence, what you're saying is you should be wearing a mask for school unless you want to stay home for a week. Um, the CDC has already stated, as the previous um, citizen said before, that PCR tests, PCR tests aren't accurate, accurate. The inventor himself said that they were never accurate, and he got taken down off YouTube because, because he called Dr. Fauci a liar. Okay, so why was that censored? The inventor himself, and this is what we're placing all of this information on. We have been breathing in SARS viruses our whole lives. It is a cold. Are people dying from COVID or are they dying with COVID? Two very different things. So what is the benefit of quarantining healthy children? 
an asymptomatic, Dr. Fauci himself says that an asymptomatic patient cannot, you, you can't give something to someone that you do not have. <laughs> it, it, it just doesn't happen. So if a child is asymptomatic and they're kept overnight and their mother decides, okay, they don't have a fever, they're feeling okay, why can they not return to school the next day? I feel, maybe not, I, and this is just what I feel is happening, and it may not be true, but I feel like we're playing into a political agenda. We're playing into something, you are allowed to question science, but when it's propaganda, you are shut down and you're censored and you're not allowed to ask. And that's what's happening in our country and that's what's happening here in Jackson County with our schools. And I'm sorry, as an adult, I can handle this and I can speak out, but I will not subject a child. I will not subject my children, my, my sixth grader, to, to this. I'm just not going to put her in this position. So we're, we're going to have to do something different. Rethink the quarantine thing, Please, maybe, yeah. because, because I feel like it's like, oh, we're not going to in, uh, enforce masks, but apparently the principal at West Jackson the other day was in the atrium talking about how everyone should be wearing masks and probably should get vaccinated by a non-FDA approved vaccine. No. Thank you for what you do, and I'm sorry for yelling, but at least I didn't cry. <laughs> So this really is not a public hearing. I think, I don't think, I truly do understand what you're saying. So again, we're supposed to have one representative from the cause, and I, I clearly hear you. I, unless you have something that is in addition and not related directly to what this is, I, I think it's the request of the board that we move on. Uh, I hear you. What I want you to hear from me is that I respect your opinion. I want you to know, as I said, I have two children in our school district. I don't want them quarantined. I don't want them to be out of school. We walk a very fine line in protecting the public interest, abiding by the DPH letters that we get that mandate that we report. And so we have a responsibility. But I hear you loud and clear and we intentionally limited our quarantines and we will continue to do that. So I, I appreciate what you're saying and unless you have something that is above and beyond or, or different than the information we've heard, I think it's in the best interest of a board that we move on. What if, what if, no, no, yeah. if I could just come forward, that would be great. For, can, can you limit your comments to one or two minutes, please? Jamie Stanford. I am at 789 Hancock Place in Bradenton. I am, this is a therapy dog for West Jackson School. Um, I just brought him just because, why not? He's cute, right? Um, okay, so my, the issue that I would like to touch on, thank you so much for, for listening to her because she's, she's a very wise woman. What I want to touch on is something that is emotional for me. And I, I'm, I can't promise that I'm not going to cry because it is my kids. I kept my two youngest out last year, okay? My oldest, who's a ninth grader, was just developed last year, diagnosed last year, um, with Tourette's, with OCD, and a sensory disorder, okay? He physically cannot put on a mask. Now, I'm not gonna touch on what the, the specifics that she did. Emotionally, what is happening to these kids in the school, I've seen it in the four days I've been there. A kid comes in with a mask, a teacher gives the kid candy. Oh, I'm not joking. Wow. I've seen this with my own eyes. I'm in the school every day with this dog. What? Okay? And, I, and here's the thing. These are kindergartners. They want candy. So what's going to happen? They're going to wear a mask. Let's fast forward to ninth grade. Let's fast forward to ninth grade. I have a ninth grader who would not, I'm shaking more than he would be standing here. But because of his issues, he would be stuttering so bad. In fact, I asked him to come, and he wants to get this message out. He is so passionate about what he went through as an eighth grader last year. 
It's not about you mandating. It's about the incentives that are going on in the school that I am personally asking you to stop. I'm personally asking you to reach out to these principals and tell them to tell their staff, stop. Yeah. These are parents. You are educators. There is a boundary and there is a line that's being crossed. Because, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I send my, my second grader to school, okay? She knows. If you are told to put on a mask, you call the front office, you go to the front office, you call me, okay? But what's happening to these kids is they're not being sent to school with a mask and they're being handed masks. They're being gifted. Just get it and you can get candy. So then they strap it on their face. I also saw a kid get off the bus the other day, off the bus to school with a mask on. He's doing this. Green. Put some masks back on. These are things that teachers aren't seeing because they're busy. They do not need to be giving these kids incentive. I don't care if they're in kindergarten. I don't care if they're in ninth grade. And I think I kind of got off a second ago, but my eighth grader last year, you guys, the amount of crap I had to deal with. My son, who is so incredibly genius smart, who was head of his percussion um, instrument group, who's now in the high school, was being bullied by other kids because teachers were pushing the mask, so the kids thought they could bully him for not wearing a mask. When he has a sensory disorder, and he can't. But what's happening is, I reached out to his doctor this year. This is two days ago. I reached out to his doctor and I said, listen, I need to schedule time to sit with you. We cannot do masks again. We cannot do masks again. He said, Jamie, I understand you. I 100% agree with you that masks, because of his issues, are going to cause him to not be able to pay attention in class. They will. With all three of the issues he has, he can't pay attention. But he said, I cannot write you an exemption. Because if your son comes down with COVID, he can be held responsible. So we're stuck. We're stuck. So while we all are very passionate, and I appreciate your patience and listening, we're all passionate about different issues, but we need to keep education and home life very separate, and please, again, stop the incentives. All grades. I'm yes. begging you. We appreciate your, your comments, Ms. Gunther. We, we appreciate it. So we're going to Continue, continue on with our with our meeting. We're going to move to facilities and operations now. Yes, I'm going to pass this mic down. Mr. Gilbert and team are going to give us an update. Good evening, board members and visitors. Uh, the first thing I share with you tonight is the uh, monthly projects report that we provide you each month. This one we expanded just a little bit to give you some more information on summer projects and school opening. And so you can read through that and see uh, the highlights on the larger projects and some of the smaller projects. We uh, provided some uh, photographs, as you see on the screen now, some nice aerials that were taken uh, by Mr. Logan of the county. And just to give you a bird's eye view of it. And then you'll see other projects as well. The one you're looking at right now is the West Jackson Middle School parking lot that coincides with the development of the Gum Springs Park next door. And then you'll, I think the last ones that you'll see are, are the uh, paving project. Well, that, I'm sorry, that's East Jackson Elementary. That's the new outdoor pavilion that's going in there. And the last ones are uh, the seal coating and striping, restriping of the East Jackson Comprehensive High School lots, which um, added a lot of um, help in need at East Jackson High. The final part, the final few pages are the, is the financial report for each project and where we are on those. There's the new information is in yellow. There's no change orders. There's just uh, standard monthly payments. Dr. Howard, I'll turn it over. If there are no questions, I'll be glad to answer any, but if there are no questions, back to you for the Gordon Street Center update.
Is it live? Okay, thank you. So the only thing I wanted to bring forth to our board, which is very exciting, is that our um, agreement with the Board of Commissioners has been approved, and so we look forward to uh, delivering this facility to the Board of Commissioners. Uh, they, we did come to a sale agreement, which we think is mutual bene mutually beneficial, so we will have that sales agreement for you on Monday. Um, our B wing is to be vacated by uh, January the 1st, which we pretty close in the rest of the building by March 31st, so we will be working diligently to re uh, to relocate and to establish residency for the wonderful <laughs> teaching and learning and technology and school nutrition departments that are still here. Then we also have talked to Ted, you want to pick this up? We we need to we need to uh, have a conversation and it doesn't necessarily have to be tonight, but we just want to keep it on the forefront that we are building a new facility next door to the new high school. It's already graded and we'll be looking forward to getting that out of the ground in the next three to four months. Um, but we are going to need a name for this new school. So the board needs to be thinking about uh, the naming process and what you'd like to name. You, we've told you that the name of the road that that school is on is Legacy Knoll. And so um, that is for your consideration, but we, we do want you to keep that on the forefront. And then we've got um, Godot, uh, Georgia Department of Education requires us to have approval for any future school sites. And as you know, we've got a couple of sites that we actually have four sites that we're looking at. Uh, and Mr. Gilbert and his team have worked diligently. You want to speak to the work that's gone into that? It was part of our normal due diligence on uh, investigating a potential site. We also required to get Georgia DOE approval for that site. And we have various factors that they asked us to investigate prior to that. And these are those documents now for each of the four sites. There's two at the Skelton Road property, and there's two in the northern part of Jackson County that are uh, under contract. So we bring those to you. They require board approval, Mr. Clarice's signature, and then we submit to the state. This is not the final decision on it. This is just one of the due diligence items, a very important one, that we complete before we ask the board to approve the final uh, purchase. In the case of Skelton, we're already on that side, both sites, but the other one is uh, under contract. So, any questions on any of that? I'll be glad to answer. Is the new school that's being built by the high school an elementary or middle school? Or? Well, that, that we're going to have a facilities conversation with our board right now. It's being designed to provide middle school relief but we're going to discuss some configuration opportunities that we have to try to get some relief to our elementary schools as well. We do have an elementary plan uh, for another school to go in on some property that the board presently has a contract, but the existing school that you see next door to, to the new Jack County High School will provide middle school relief. All right, I think Anna is with us. Um, I'm not sure, Anna, if you want to speak to our financial updates. We have some very good news. I'll go ahead and bring up um, SLOSS first, which is good news again. Perfect. Thank you, Erin. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so I think our first report is the SLOSS report. And for everybody visiting, SLOSS is an extra penny of sales tax that we pay when we buy things in Jackson County. Our portion in June was $950,000, which is really good news. It's over every measure. So over last year, over a month before, over the average, which we've been seeing consistently, and it's very exciting. And that money is um, not used on the teachers and things that you see on our budget. That's for buildings and special projects that are approved in the SLOSS referendum that was voted on. We're able to keep our bond millage uh, at a pretty good rate as well because we attribute about a third of our earnings to go towards bond millage debt, debt service. Excellent, thank you. Uh -huh. General fund, yes, which, where do you want to start? <laughs> Why don't you start with your end? Okay, I love that. that might be No, we, we close our year at the end of July. 
uh, excuse me, at the end of June, July 1 is uh, the beginning of our next fiscal year. So we have year-end reports, and then we also have the month of July reports. So, Aaron? Yes, so we're closing last year. There's still a lot of work to do, a lot of reconciliations and special reporting we have to do at the state level. So um, these are an update to what you saw last month. Um, so our ending fund balance for fiscal year 21 is 23 million seven hundred eighty three thousand eight eighty six ninety one um, And you can see when we planned at the beginning of the year we intended to be at 18 million a lot of that cares money that came and helped us out We've got a much better balance there, which leads us to this year and puts us in a really good place for the growth we're experiencing and planning um, so, end of July, our fund balance is 20 million. And um, when we look at the financial report, there was a change at the state level that kind of affects us. We've been reporting financials to you every month. So, for our system, that's not a new thing. We've been talking about this every month for a long time. What's new is they've asked us to report encumbrances. So, as you look at that, there's a lot. There's more columns to look at. And encumbrances is when we have promised money for a purchase. So um, I think, you know, my opinion is that's a good thing for us to communicate to you. We have ordered something or committed to something. People should know that money has been spent. Whether it's left our checking account yet or not, we're gonna pay it. Um, so we are at 8% of the year and we've only received 4% of the revenue which is common for only being one month into the year. Most of our revenues will come later. And our expenditures are at 9%, which is pretty close to eight. And getting a new school year started, there's a lot of spending to do. So I feel like people are being very responsible. And we've seen that a lot in our county with people following their budgets and being fiscally responsible. So are there any questions? Reminder too that several of our support business and things like that are what we comp and things that we pay twice a year. So, to start up in July, you've got some of those startup costs early on insurance liability and so forth. Any questions of our board? We are in a really good place financially, and we are fortunate that we can make this millage recommendation rollback and looking forward to a great next year. Thank you. All right, I believe next we have uh, Ms. Cameron Todd, who is our HR Director, um, and the, our board has a copy of our personnel recommendations, which will be on the agenda for approval on Monday, um, but you, any comments on the personnel recommendations, Ms. Todd? Nope, not at this time. Okay, good. I was going to just bring to your attention our enrollment, and um, Ms. Todd and Ms. Wilson, who are here, can speak a little bit to our each of our schools and the increases that we're seeing. Um, we're definitely seeing an enrollment. We've um, increased, as Anna alluded to a little while ago, we've seen at least 600 students, I think 600, 600 students uh, from the end of last year to this year. But as we go through these first 10 days of school, we will have some students that um, we're expecting to be here, but they don't show. So. Um, we work with the schools, and so we'll, when we bring to you the end of August report, that'll have a, a more act, you know, as far as how many students are living in the building. Um, and so that, that may come down a little bit, but we are still huge growth going on, and, and we'll just see that continue. You want to speak to seller subs? I'm navigating back and forth between these multiple screens here. I apologize. Um, sure. So we did go back and, and speak with our principals about having the what they refer to as a stellar sub in their building. In other words, it's a sub that they can depend on, that will be there on a consistent basis so that when something happens, someone calls in sick, they need coverage for um, a classroom, maybe there's professional learning happening in the building, that sub is there and is available to be able to cover um, absences in the building. We fund these through our contract with ESS, which is our support service, 
and um, we have worked with Anna to look at how that would impact budget and at this time it doesn't make a huge impact to keep those on. What I will say is we are going to implement some new uh, monitoring measures to just track the use of those subs so that we've got good data at the end of this school year to determine if those are necessary in all of our locations or are some schools in need of those more than others. And so we're excited that we've been able to partner with um, ESS and our finance department have entered some new codes for us and we'll be able to track those a lot better than we have in the past and um, have some good data to show that that is something that we need to continue or tweak the process a little. So, so for those of us don't have a history of education. Um, you explain that again, the, the seller sub, how are they available? Does that mean they're on site every day? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So typically what would happen is if a teacher or a, an employee calls in and they are going to be absent, the system starts to call a list of people. That might take a little while before someone is there and can get to the site to cover for that teacher. A stellar sub would be someone who's committed to showing up every day when school starts and then be assigned once they get there. Um, so they would have that person, or they know that person is going to be there and they can dispatch them immediately instead of if a call comes in, you know, 10 minutes before school starts, someone's ill, they're not going to make it, that process has to start to find a replacement and that might take a little while. Um, so this is just a way to have somebody there and ready and able to cover for us um, in those situations. This person would be, a, you'd have one or two at every school? One right now, just one. At yeah. every? Yes, sir. At every school? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. <laughs> it can be, yes, sir. It, it's, a, it's usually pulling away. It's causing another problem to solve a problem, usually without the support in the building. The other thing, that seller sub becomes a part of the culture of that school because mm -hmm. they're, instead of getting sent all over the county, they, they're repeat and they're kind of assigned to a school and then they become a part of it, so they're on call. Doesn't mean, like you said, it's somebody else needs them, but it, they become a part of the school. So uh, we just wanted you to know, last year the seller subs were critically important because we were in such a unique situation with COVID. We're not seeing that type of need this year, but it is nice to be able to have, and we want to just make sure that they are being used every single day, and that's what we're going to be trying to do. The next item is additional personnel requests, and we are carefully monitoring our enrollment paired with our attendance and the number of students that are there, and looking at our classroom uh, sizes, making sure that we're in, at manageable class sizes and our students have a positive experience. Right now, we only have one area that we're a little concerned about, so Ms. Todd, you want to speak to that? I do, and that area is special education. Um, we have a self-contained classroom at Gum Springs Elementary School that serves some of our special needs students with, with very high needs. Um, students that are going to need a lot of um, assistance from adults. The projected enrollment for that classroom was at eight, and they are now currently sitting at almost 12. So depending on the students. And we are going to ask if, if with the board's blessing that we go ahead and move forward. We have a generic SPED posting out there, but we would like to fill another special education teacher to come in and support those students so that we can divide that classroom and, um, and have those children served by a teacher and a para. Two paras are already there, but we'd be able to split the instruction of the classroom between two teachers instead of one due to the growth. Yes, sir. This is the class that has medically fragile students as well, so it's the right thing to do, I believe. Students can, I speak, can I speak on that really quick? I, I'm a mother of a special needs child. Uh, Avery, McCarter, and Jacob Carter are the children that are here in the room. I think I've emailed you before you could hang. Clarissa, 
Sure, some of Cart 365, some of you drive. Hey, I just wanted to mention on that, I was actually going to ask that question um, because Avery was quarantined some last year. Um, the funding for the special needs department when they are quarantined, because we did have that issue with Avery. You can't send them home with a laptop. It doesn't work. So what is the position moving forward? If the, Now, there's some children that they can go home and they don't have to be really taught, per se, in the special ed program. Avery does. Everybody knows Avery. Um, so is there additional funding that will be provided to the special needs children or that department when those children do have to be quarantined due to COVID? So two answers to that. Yes, there are, we have IDEA funds, and I think you know Ms. Tammy Simpson, surely our, our director of special ed. And so we, we have CARES funds, and if there are additional needs, we can. So that's what those CARES funds are for when we have situations that a student need a learning loss. Um, and so our goal is to limit quarantine. Um, and so that's that's our ultimate goal. But if there is a need, then we have funds available for, to meet the needs of our special needs students as well as all of our students. Okay, I know that last year that was, I mean, if we were all kind of in shock and kind of had to go with the flow. And so that came up because Avery did come home with a laptop. It's like, what am I supposed to do with this? Avery can't work from a laptop. Um, that's not what she's learning. She's learning how to interact with her peers and how to get along in society. And those things are important. So that funding, the special needs program. I know we were at the, the elementary school now where she's graduated up to the high school. But just wanted to make sure that, that that program especially means a lot to me. The quarantine is definitely, I, I was going to ask you too, how long is the quarantine right now? Um, so I know this crowd response on this. <laughs> the CDC recommends 10 to 14 days. What we started with this year was to monitor your symptoms for the next five days and come back. Based on this feedback and the guidance that I get from the board, we will continue to evaluate. Our goal is to have kids in school. We cut it in half based on what the CDC recommended, but our, again, we want kids in school. So okay. I, I, yeah, and I would just ask that you take special consideration to children such as Avery that do not understand when she cannot be in school. I have Absolutely. three other regular ed children. That's a little bit different, but Avery does not understand it's devastating to her. Absolutely. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. So, we, do we have the board support for moving forward with that additional position? Okay, so we will, we'll pass. Okay, great, thank you for that. We'll get started with that. And then, um, Ms. Tyler, I don't know if you'd like to speak to, uh, you, and, you and Mr. Farmer can speak together about the, uh, the combination of, of efforts here with our transportation, special education routing, as well as training supervisor. Sure, and I'll, um, I'll start by saying this is not a new position that we're bringing to you. This position is already in the budget and exists. It hasn't been filled yet, but um, Mr. Farmer and I, along with uh, Todd Nicholson and, and Dr. Howard, kind of came up with a great way of solving a problem, and that problem is um, the need for a special education routing supervisor for our transportation department. And Mr. Farmer can give you some data on the buses and what all that entails to support those students. The position that currently exists is the training supervisor position that hadn't been filled yet. So we're asking the board's permission to revise a job description to combine those two elements and it would not impact anything budget-wise, but just changing the job description to add duties to a training supervisor to pick up and help us with some of the special education needs we have in transportation. Does the board have any questions about that? Um, it's, it's a combination of the driver training specialist uh, responsibilities that we talked about at the um, meetings before. I think the biggest thing is it, it now would include the responsibilities of maintaining the routing for special education students. This pays particular attention to the IEPs to make sure um, that those are being met from a transportation standpoint. Uh, also that the training uh, is included in that to make sure that they are ready. It does require special training on special needs buses, we know. Um, we started it with 151 students that rode the Special ed buses, now we're up to 170 um, students that actually currently ride special ed buses. That entails 20 buses along with 20 monitors. 
So that, uh, that training is intense in depth, and we just want to make sure that we continue that. Um, here again, this combines both responsibilities. Um, that way we don't have to have two separate positions. This is just one to continue to support our, not only our growth, and if that growth continues, then we will continue to have to add uh, special ed buses along with drivers and monitors for those buses. Would be supervisor position before, yes, they would have they would have had direct supervision over the uh, new coming the up and coming drivers and also the existing drivers and monitors. This also includes the King Bento students, um, any any student that require an educational special education bus. Uh, ride. A lot yeah. of training that goes into services. When they're already doing the routing, is this person already doing the routing, or you are adding? The this, this person will actually take over that routing aspect of it, so they will create the routes, they will make sure that they're efficient. The, the biggest thing we're trying to accomplish here is to make sure our routes are not so long um, for the special education students. We've already added the bus this year, and we're four or five days in the school, so the need is continuing to fare and it's continuing to grow. So yes, sir, they will be responsible for the routing, they would be responsible for attending IEP meetings to make sure that if we need a harness, if it's a wheelchair, if it's a five-point uh, harness, to make sure those needs are met. We also transport medically fragile children. Uh, so those are, um, a lot of times it's it's the right car seat. It's making sure that when those get on the bus, the students get on the bus, the first day of school are ready to go. We're trained in what we do. We also have a lot of children that have uh, EpiPen, Dynastat, um, they're training CPR, making sure that, that uh, Glugon, anything that, that that child would need, that we're prepared to meet that need on these buses. And currently all of those responsibilities were falling on the routing supervisors for the east side and the west side. So they were having to, in addition to the routing that they were doing for general education students, pick up those responsibilities. So we're, we're, we're taking that and making sure one person is very well trained in that and able to handle all of that for the district to ensure that those special needs students are getting exactly what they need with shorter routes. And just as the supervisors do now, they are the liaison for the schools. They also will contact parents if parents have issues on those routes along myself. They will contact those and make sure that those are resolved. Just need us to approve this revised job description. Is that I would love it if you would, but yes, sir, that's what we brought to you is just a revised job description. And Mr. Clarence, just to clarify too, they also will be CDL holders. So if they are needed on a bus, as our supervisors are, they will also uh, fill in for uh, special ed drivers that are absent in that case. All right, so that 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 was actually to tell the truth, David, what we talked about is we need a special ed routing supervisor. We said we gotta find a way to make this two jobs, not just, I mean at least two jobs just yes. one. So it's it's not as I just want to reiterate it's not a new job, it's just a combination of, of duties and responsibilities and That's the job true. this uh, routing supervisor was um, already in. So all right. Um, leadership and performance. I just want to remind you that um, the board meeting is scheduled to highlight South Jackson Elementary School on Monday. And so I, I believe our board was going to consider having our board meeting here, um, and we will highlight South Jackson Elementary School, and we look forward to celebrating some other successes at that school and other student successes. And we also have um, AB and AP and IB results. I'm going to bring those up and let Ms. Wilson speak a little bit to some of our student performance from last year that we're proud of. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Um, yes, this is a, a, a report that... Um, Jennifer Sane, who's the Director of Personalized Learning, and I put together, she oversees this, um, these departments. And um, anyway, we looked at and gave you some comparison numbers of the students that um, were in the programs last year. With, you know, the College Board oversees the AP program, um, and that, uh, as we went through the year with COVID, we were actually very concerned that we were, whether or not students were even going to be able to take these exams um, or not. And so we were very glad that that ended up working. We had 
Um, they did have some remote students that, that did it that way as well. So we've given you both the um, enrollments, how many students, um, and how many classes they actually take in AP, both for last year and then the enrollments for this year, and kind of gave you a comparison of the school enrollment to see how many students we have in that program. And then the uh, performance of the, those that passed uh, or have a three or higher on an AP exam um, have potential for getting college credit for that class. Um, and those of that would be up to the specific university or, or college that they go to as to whether or not that, you know, how that goes and whether they get that college credit. But that's a lot of um, great savings for parents, <laughs> as you know. Um, and then we also added in the dual enrollment information how many students we have involved in that process as well, uh, both for last year and for the enrollments for this year. And as you can see, those programs are growing, which is a great thing. And, um, and then we want to brag a lot on the IB program. Um, the, that is a, it's a small for us, a brand new program, but for the first year, their performance was 86%, which is completely, I mean, normally, on a first year IB program, um, they're looking for someone to have a, like a 70% pass rate. That's really good. So um, considering ours were 80, it was 86%, that's really phenomenal performance by that group of students. Um, do you, you know, anyone have any questions about any of that? Um, we gave you the two responsible for each of those at each high school um, so, so that you know who takes care of that. Martha, thank you so much, and I, I do want to send a shout out to our high, well, all of our schools, but our high schools for pushing through and making sure that our students didn't give up on those um, testing opportunities last year and had high expectations, and our, and our students rose to the occasion one, once again. And I want to, on behalf of uh, Jen, who's not here, and, and others, thank the board for their continued support of these programs. The International Baccalaureate Program is a heavy lift to get that off the ground, but once you get it off the ground, it provides an opportunity that is very, very, exempl it's exemplary and it's rare. So our students now have access to something that sets them a, a, a grade above for sure. So proud of those, all of those programs and their program leaders as well. All right, thank you very much for putting that together and it, it does give our, the exciting part is we get to talk about something that it, really what we're all about, which is teaching and learning and, and serving kids, for sure. So we're proud of that, that work there. All right, I'm going to ask if Dr. Mary Blackburn and Mr. John Eastler can give us a little bit of an update on how things are going. I have my own uh, observational data, but very excited about what we've seen um, happening at Empower in just a few short days. We're kind of tag team this. I thought I'd draw the short straw tonight for all the talking. Thank you for calling Dr. Blackburn up here because, Lord, we are at a very proud moment, I think, in Jackson County. You have invested very significantly in a new type of learning for our young people. And this process has been a very, very long process. And we are here, and I believe that the dream is now a reality for a lot of folks in Jackson County. I've been in education for 22 years now, and we sat and talked for a little while the other day, and I can say this first day of school, this past Friday, and then again on Tuesday, because we had two first days of school, was the best first day of school I've had in my entire educational career. Things are great. Things are awesome. Do we have little hiccups and little things that we're working out along the way? Yes, but I believe that our community and our Board of Education and our parents and especially our students are very proud with what they have in a facility that doesn't look like it did just a matter of a couple months ago. In opportunities that most of these young people didn't realize that they were going to have when they walked into a high school. We have between our littles and our bigs, as Dr. Blackburn likes to mention, 1,500 students that are coming into our building on an every other day basis. And it is fun and it is exciting. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate this all-star staff that you've allowed us to accumulate to make this happen, to have this partner that I get to work with on a daily basis to make this happen. And I'm gonna let Dr. Blackburn talk a little bit about what's going on with our students, so thank you. Now you already hired John to talk. And I was hired to work with kids and teachers. 
Sorry, you can't even hear me, and I thought there'd be a short joke to begin the whole thing. Um, it's, it's always the way we are. We said Mutt and Jeff to the kids the other day, and they didn't know what we were talking about. But that's okay. Uh, we are so delighted with what is happening, and the partnership that we have with East Jackson and with Jackson County High Schools, um, Martha Wilson and Sandy Aiken, I just want to tell everyone that you have no idea what an undertaking it is to schedule a career academy, to work together to gain consistency among three high schools. Um, I've always said that the hardest thing in the world is not a diamond, it's a faculty resistant to change. And this is, however our teachers have, they have come together, um, we are united in Empower. We're really trying to reach out to the two high schools and make sure that this is a high school endeavor. Um, we do have the pre-K on our campus, which, and I, I'm sorry, I have to say this, but um, my office, I can hear the bathroom, and they sing their ABCs every time they wash their hands. So about six times a day, I hear a full set of ABCs and applause. So it's a great way to work. I have to say my environment is probably the best in the district because none of you get to hear that. Um, but we are so pleased with everything in the way it's been going. We are talking to our kids about the Empower Way, talking to our teachers about the Empower Way. We want our students to be independent and to have grit and resilience and be kind. And, you know, um, so we're trying to reach out to the kids that when we see a child who randomly helps another child, we're trying to reach out to the parents and say, your child is exhibiting the Empower Way. That's exactly what we're trying to get forth. And, and the workforce um, agrees. You know, we need people who can work together and support each other and bring each other up. And in a time when it's not always easy to, to see light because of COVID, um, that's what we're all about, is trying to get and lift and empower each other um, and our students, and that is why we're here. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for hiring me. I appreciate it. I've taken the privilege to just go visit every day since it started, and I've I just continue to be amazed at how our students rise to the occasion. It just truly, truly proves that if you empower them, expect they rise to that level and they are living the empower way. So thank you for that. Mr. Cosby. Quick question. Does this involve all three schools in the county? It's open to all three school districts, but right now just East Jackson and Jackson County are participating. So yes, we sir. have no students from Jefferson? No, sir. Doors open whenever they're ready to send their students or ready to accept them. I think I just heard what you said. Thank you. We, we, appreciate, we appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Nicholson, you want to give a brief update on our progress on Jackson Connect, which is also another sort of a pilot program, but it's showing amazing evidence already. We have a plan. I apologize for taking a minute. We have a degree. It's just difficult. We have a new meeting with it. Um, I want to echo what John and Mary just mentioned about not only empowering, but just to start the school year that we have our board support and our strategic plan over the last, really at this point, seven years. We had a goal of personalized learning, and our support is the epitome of that in terms of preparing students for the future. But Jackson Connect is kind of a, a soft launch of sorts. We introduced it every last year. We had some families that wanted a, a learning experience that didn't feel like the traditional experience. And we went through an um, interview process and had, um, after the application process, and we, we did a whole lot of around 50 students. And I don't know that we've ever received as many positive first day emails, texts, reminder messages. And then it's not a criticism of, of anything that we've already done before. It's just, we really kind of niche for people who just appreciate and a different approach to learning. So this is kind of our um, kind of our incubator and innovation of sorts, where we every student has a personalized learning plan. Uh, it's as we started, it's largely virtual, but it's not limited to being virtual. So that's pretty exciting because we have kids that are required to come in for portions a day, get home for the portions a day. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the kids. Uh, Teachers do an amazing job 
preparing for experience with it. This is a two-teach program with Eric doing five grade bands, four academic clubs per grade band. So that's 20 clubs plus five arts in there that are focusing right now on art and music. So there are not a lot of people out there doing 22 clubs every day. Uh, it's a, it's a, a true partnership between the students, teachers, and parents, and it's, right now it's really Education. I want you to know how much we appreciate your support. The, it, it was a difficult year last year. We're absolutely committed and still remain committed to launching and having a wonderful school year. And I hope that you see that our teachers are absolutely committed to that. So we're still looking forward to a wonderful year ahead in spite of some of the challenges that we face. Monday night, right here. 